a meeting to order. Um, welcome to the June 1st Fayetteville Urban Forestry Advisory Board meeting. We're going to meet in person and also virtually. I'm Lacey Jennon, board chairman, and I and other board members, urban forestry staff, parks and recreation staff, and IT staff are in remote locations conducting this meeting either by phone or online using Zoom software. The voices you may hear during this meeting are all being recorded for public record. We always value public participation. We have provided many ways for the public to view this Urban Forestry Advisory Board meeting. Viewing through the city's website, including on Fayetteville's online government channel and through Fayetteville's YouTube channel. This public meeting will allow for comments when I open the floor for public comment. To comment, use raise hand function when comment for an item is requested. For phone, raise hand to be recognized with star nine. Phone numbers used to dial into the meeting will be masked for privacy. All participants will be muted automatically when joining the meeting. I would like to remind Urban Forestry Advisory Board members and staff to mute your mics unless you are requesting to speak. And we'll take roll. All right. John Crow. Here. Zane Colvin. Ken Easton. Here. William Chesser. Here. Lacey Jennon. Here. Samuel Atkinson. Here. And Jim Parrish. Here. Right, did everybody get a chance to review last month's minutes? Any changes or anything? Motion to approve. Second. Just the addition of. Yes, that Jim's going to be the July presentation. All right. Good. All right. We can add that. Made a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of approving? What do I do with that? All right. Aye. 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 Go ahead. <laughs> no. Figure that out. You're probably saying I that. I push the answer. Oh my goodness. Hey, this is Virginia with Media Services. Hate to interrupt your meeting, but you might want to start the Zoom. Zane Colvin is waiting on the Zoom meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. You're welcome. The uh, it, I'm not getting the, well, I probably can pull it up on my. I could resend the link to you or a different email if you need. Well, it's not popping up, unfortunately. <coughs> no, let's see. Let's get our new so login. Go all. <laughs> yeah, they're still there. We found a couple again. It's, no, it's going to require this one to update. I'm not sure how we can do that. Um, but we'll have to go ahead and get this update. I might have to call uh, IT to get them to update this outlook. I was that. That's why I was looking at you, by the way. There should be an email with the link in the email. You shouldn't have to go through a calendar. Uh, yeah, but my... Um, Email won't update on this particular computer because it needs to update Outlook. All right, let's see if I can get IT in there to help. Thank you. You're welcome. Yay, technology. Yay. Okay. I told you. At least we could answer the phone. That was good. Well, yeah. I couldn't yeah. could figure out how to do it. I knew that. <laughs> it was a I knew that's why they were phone. <clears throat> I was hoping it was my phone. I was like, is this a touch screen? I was trying to answer on the screen. <laughs> So that, I'm guessing the only way you can open your emails is right? no, no, correct. Correct. No. Interface. No. Um, it's hard to be a good setting. A lot of times I can't feel the button. Yeah. Last year, we were reading that form where it's just normal. And I think two or three went back to Chesney the rest of them. Yeah, those are going last year. So they're there. <laughs>
pay, it doesn't it doesn't do anything, you know. <laughs> Why haven't you gone to help with some other files? Yeah, I was going to Hi, Brittany again. Josh with IT said if you go to outlook.office.com, you can sign in that way and access the link to Zoom that way. Office.com. Official website, yeah. Here's the link. That should have opened up something. That's weird. Is it that south section? There you go. Thank you, Virginia. You're, you're welcome. But I'm going to stay in the line until I make sure you're connected. think a little bit about invasive species and, you know, sort of what that means. Um, I'm not an ecologist. Uh, I'm not <laughs> an expert in any way in this field. Uh, anybody know what this is? I think it's a bandit to me or something. Horsefly or deerfly maybe? Gadfly. Not an invasive. So why a gadfly? This guy is. No, come on. Aristotle? The gadfly. Aristotle? Socrates. Socrates. Oh. Now there's the gadfly um, because he sort of just buzzed around um, stinging people with uh, questions that were pretty annoying. Now, I'm not setting myself up to be Socrates, but I am annoying. Um, and I do like to ask questions to get people to sort of rethink things. Now, of course, we all remember what happened to Socrates. Um, anybody remember this? Poison hemlock. Something about the Drank hemlock. the hemlock. <laughs> uh, my favorite uh, quote about this is, do you know what Socrates' last words were? I drank what? <laughs> so, we consider all these things invasive species, depending on where you are. Um, Australia, the rest of these are part of the United States. But, you know, some of these, it's weird to me, lionfish are things that, you know, used to be really expensive, right, I think. Um, boa constrictors, both of these started out as pets. Um, how did Japanese honeysuckle get over here, anybody know? Yeah, it was game and fish. Game and fish? Yeah, erosion control. Erosion control. And browse. Probably does a decent job of that. It just gets gets out of hand, right? 
uh, cane toad in Australia, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, zebra mussels. But what makes them invasives? So USD says invasives are non-native or alien to the ecosystem species under consideration, and their introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Okay. But that's pretty broad. And when when I think about it, I don't know, it gets this gets hairy for me pretty quickly, okay? Because I'm going to talk about a few things about how part two could be viewed. How about these things? Non-native. <laughs> Non-native, but why two different pictures of bees? Anybody know? One of these is considered invasive. One is not. Africanized, maybe? Yeah. European honeybee, Africanized honeybee, or killer bee. Um, at least this is what Google tells me. I kept looking at this, and I was like, man, I could not tell those apart. But this picture did claim to be, and I found several, claimed to be this is a, an Africanized honeybee, or a uh, a killer bee. Killer bees because they'll swarm. Okay, but non-native. And I would argue, if we go back in time a little bit, according to the definition, well, definitely uh, ecological harm, right? Uh, but at this point, we've decided we want them. Some of these things to me come down to the question of is it a weed or not, right? And that's just really kind of a question of my own value judgment, right, or your own value judgment. I would argue any of these could fit under invasive, depending on where you go and where they are, OK? These are all things that are frequently in non-native regions, right? Um, that one's native, but kind of in this monoculture, kind of feels like it fits part of the part two, right? There are definitely people who would say this causes harm right, in terms of corn syrup or definitely causes harm to environments in terms of ecology can. Apples are non-native. Potatoes are from the new world, but have been taken, have definitely caused economic and um, human harm in different contexts throughout uh, throughout the world. I mean, that's Ireland. Ooh, hello. Um, coffee, of course, is perfect, and um, <laughs> we shouldn't judge it in any way. That's right. All right, how about these guys? Does anyone know what those are? Finches. They are finches, specifically. Darwin's finches on um, well, Galapagos. Galapagos. Thank you. Non-native. Would we call them invasive? Now, we think one gravid female or a small flock of birds got blown from South America to the Galapagos. And then from that one finch sort of bred and evolved and uh, adapted and s split out into all these different species. Anybody here want to call them an invasive to the Galapagos? Probably not, right? Well, that's weird, but they're not from there, right? And they definitely filled out ecological net niches and changed the ecology there, but we don't call them invasive. And I think it comes down to this a question of what is natural. We might say, well, the, the finches got there naturally, right? They were blown there by a wind or something. But my question is this. What does it mean to be natural versus non-natural? To me, it just comes down to are humans involved. But why do we consider the activities of humans non-natural? I wonder about this. These ants are not going to eat these leaves. Anybody know what they're going to do with them? Raise fungi, maybe. Yes, they're going to take them down into the ground, and they're going to farm fungi that they're going to eat, OK? Boy, that feels like farming to me, right? Only we call this natural. We call this. I mean, this is doubly unnatural, because this is clearly also a stage photo. Those aren't real people. I mean, they are real people, but. Well, they're actors, so I don't know if they're real. It's a joke. Please don't send <laughs> actors. I'm, I wanted to be an actor for a while. No, it wasn't. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. 
a good point. Okay, you get, guess where I'm going here? Who made this? Beavers. Beavers. But natural, non-natural. Well, they're doing very similar things, right? If we go forward, we go like, well, we can even diagram the inside of them. Here's this one, it produces electricity. This one produces a home for beavers, right? They've got structure internally, they're doing things, but somehow this guy's work is natural. This lady's work, because she's an engineer, <laughs> is unnatural. That may actually be true. I've met a lot of engineers. Be um, careful. No, it's a joke. <laughs> I know. I do that every day. So this is the question, right? I think it comes down to this. Humans can't go anywhere without changing stuff, OK? If you look at where human, when humans go to a new continent, within a few hundred or thousand years, all the megafauna are dead. Coincidence? Mm, it looks like no. It looks like we cause the extinction of stuff wherever we go. But, uh, oh, here's another one. We've been doing this for uh, tens of thousands of years. These are more recent. These are in the last couple of hundred years. Passenger pigeon, the dodo, uh, sea cow, and this is not an actual black rhino, but I couldn't get a picture of one, but this is a, a regular a white rhino that's been in the mud, but we killed off the black rhino right over the past couple of hundred years too. Most of these were meat, some for sport. But in the 165 million years that the dinosaurs existed, is it possible that some of them caused the extinction of each other? I'm going to guess yes. You can't see it in the fossil record. We don't know. Okay, that's a long period of time. I'm going to guess that it happened. Is that extinction natural or non-natural? Are the extinctions we cause natural or non-natural? Doesn't matter. I don't know. This is just me asking some questions. These guys, these species went extinct, but this class did not extinct. It became this. Okay, so. Over time, how many, what percentage of species on the planet that have existed are extinct? Anybody know that one? Way over 99.99. Okay, almost every species that's existed on this planet is extinct in some way, either by dying off or simply changing into something else over enough time. Sometimes they change into these, right? This is how we have an idea that this stuff existed. This is the geologic time chart. <clears throat> we talk often, I'm, I'm thinking about the context of invasives in terms of ecology and how humans are changing the planet, right? We have a new word, the Anthropocene. Uh, this idea that we will create an extinction event that can be seen in the record, okay? And that seems like a big deal, except every line on this chart is an extinction event. Or something where a whole bunch of new species show up where they were not there before, okay? The really big extinctions are here, well, here, here, and here. This is the one right before the dinosaurs. This is the one right at the end of the dinosaurs. And this is us, way up there. So it feels like a lot of hubris to me to talk about what humans are doing to the planet, right? I mean. A lot worse has happened in the past. That doesn't mean I'm saying that it's okay what we're doing. I'm just saying, you know, maybe we need to put these things in context once in a while. Even the planet itself changes. I have a question. During Pangea, were there invasives? I mean, would we have said that in any way? And I think the answer is no, because it looks to me like, feels like we're only counting things as invasives when we brought them there. Right? I think that seems to be one of the markers. But we bring things all over the place all the time, right? I mean, this is just kind of what humans do. Again, I'm not trying to make a judgment as to whether this is good or bad. I'm just trying to rethink it. <clears throat> things that you eat today, everything you eat, almost everything you eat, is a GMO, right? Humans change things they touch. That's sort of what we do. Corn was this before Native Americans sort of pushed it to this, and it's become much larger under uh, more recent husbandry. 
Um, every apple you've ever eaten, almost certainly, was a clone. That wasn't grown from a seed, it was grown from a cutting. Um, but these are from Kazakhstan. We consider them, I mean, American is apple pie. Well, that tree wasn't here <laughs> pre-Columbian. Um, wheat, bananas, uh, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, all from different things. Everything we touch, we modify, okay? Now, it's not genetic, genetic modification as in the lab, but we're definitely changing the allele frequency of these plants. That's a modification. We're changing it. Is, does that make these things that wouldn't have existed without human intervention invasive in their own territory in a way? We change these guys into these guys. We change these guys into these. Quick question, horses, native to the, United, native to the Americas or no? I had this one wrong before. Somebody's saying yes. How, what do you mean by yes? They were originally North America. And then? Came back with the Spanish. Yes, I didn't know that till today. I was getting ready to show this as Arabia. But horses were originally in the Americas, migrated across the Bering Land Bridge, were killed off by pre-Columbian humans, we think, driven to extinction, probably eaten, and then reintroduced. I just, I thought they were invasive and turned out they're sort of moved out, moved back in kind of thing. Here we are back to the thing again. What does it mean to be an invasive species? I'll, I'm not saying, I, I don't know what this answer is. It just became an interesting question to me, okay? Non-native or alien to the ecosystem under concentration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. By that definition, here's what I would call the most invasive species. Even when they don't look like this, even when they just look like this. These are the most non-native things on the planet and they're the ones who are moving everything around. I don't have a prescription here, I don't know if I'm saying, hey, should we look at things differently? It's just every time we're like assassinating honeysuckle, which I can get on board with, it's fine. I do wonder like, it's kind of our fault. It's, it's definitely our fault it's there in the first place. I don't think we're going back. We're not, we're not gonna undo what humans have done to the planet at this point. We're not going backwards. I think Better. The, well, all, I'm, all I'm asking for is a new lens by which to look at these things and say, like, what do we want, and 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 uh, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we doing something and then undoing it? That's it. That's 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 my only question. Just a new lens through which to look at these things. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank everybody uh, for coming who came uh, separately. I, um, if anybody wants to give a little talk about how they view uh, invasives from their particular field uh, or any particular response to William's presentation is also welcome. But um, just wanting to, again, end your conversation and learn hopefully about um, experiences and expertise about um, invasive management and ecological health. You know, I think and I, I would frame that as, you know, in invasives in the context of how can we have a healthier community, and by community I mean a full community, full ecological community of people and flora and fauna uh, in total. So, um, if you all would like to introduce yeah. yourself, that would probably be... Yeah, I guess, I guess I can start. Uh, so my name is Nate Weston. I'm a geospatial ecologist with the Beaver Watershed Alliance. I have over 10 years of uh, history in college education and invasive species management, primarily uh, plant ecology. And uh, I have worked with the city of Fayetteville for, <coughs> since 2017, working on removing invasive plant species in the uh, urban area and uh, natural areas and parks corridors, as well as uh, other places throughout the Beaver Watershed. I also lead uh, educational workshops training land managers in invasive species management, identification, removal, and uh, replacement with uh, native species. 
Um, just talking about the presentation there, I would, I would like to point out if you're looking at the USDA, if you're going by the USDA's definition of an invasive species, it's going to be anthrocentric, human-centric, and so uh, your definition is going to be biased towards humans. But uh, from an ecological perspective, a species becomes invasive when it is uh, found in a location where there are no biological controls to maintain or to diminish its carrying capacity. Um, and for those of you who don't know what a carrying capacity is, it, uh, it is uh, what keeps the population from, from exploding um, due to per, uh, top, what we call top-down pressures, predation, lateral pressures, uh, our density dependent pressures such as disease, infertility, sterility, things like that. And uh, because uh, species taken out of their indigenous context and placed into a novel context lack those controls, uh, they tend to not be restrained. And so they tend to explode in population numbers, uh, strictly depending on their, at that point, they're basically just limited by. Uh, their productive pressures or how many resources they can exploit, how quickly they can reproduce. And, um, you know, not every, it's a misnomer, not every species that is exotic is invasive, not every species that is native uh, is, not ex is not invasive. You can have invasive native species, eastern red cedar. Um, plants do not respect our arbitrary uh, geometric bounds. And, um, uh, there are uh, when, an, when a species does become invasive, it can impact uh, economic issues, uh, cultural, uh, how we view our community, our personal and uh, our personal appeal of accessing the accessing nature, enjoying nature, enjoying our space, uh, as well as ecological. You know, we talk uh, it's one, probably one of the big ones how much damage they can cause the ecological webs, but there's also health consequences. Um, as we're seeing now, more and more research is showing uh, a positive feedback with uh, invasive understory shrubbery like bush honeysuckle privet with uh, tick vector diseases, Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and things like that. So it's not, I, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the hate, quote unquote, for uh, exotic or invasive species is xenophobic in nature. It's not, it's in, there's no such thing as a bad plant or a bad animal. It's just a, a bad, it's just taken out of its context. It's a, it's a good plant in the wrong place. Um, you know, uh, Bush honeysuckle is invasive. It's native to Central and East China. I'm sure there's something in Central and East China that eats it, parasitizes it, diseases it, whatever. We don't have that here. And so following that logic of, uh, of uh, becoming apathetic to the promotion of these novel ecosystems, which is what you were, the term you were looking for earlier, um, the end conclusion of that thought is basically, well, we should go to Central East China, find those things that uh, predate, disease those things, and bring them over here. So we should just have a massive amalgamation of every species, of every disease, every virus, every parasite, every uh, predator on the planet, and just combine them all in one, on one continent or, or every continent. And that would be the only way that you could maintain the, those, uh, those uh, population controls. Um, I did some back of the envelope math. Um, according to the USDA, a 2021 study uh, reported the cost or the eco economic burden of invasive plant species in the United States, according to the USDA, is uh, 26 billion dollars per year. And uh, if you factor that to just the population of Fayetteville, that comes out to 40.2 million dollars per year, or a burden of 464 dollars per person per year, just for the city of Fayetteville. And according to a, a, a 2020, 2021 study called the ecological costs of uh, biological invasions within North America. And like I said earlier, you can get into socioeconomic, uh, ecological health, personal, personal interests, things like that, um, as well as the loss of ecosystem services, which is kind of a growing field that we're still trying to define as ecologists, of uh, food production, um, regulatory services, not like legal as we would think, but that's things like uh, water cycling, nutrient cycling, um, pollination services, soil stability, as well as our cultural values, uh, music, art, architecture, recreation. Um, architects have been looking at animals and plants for millennia and getting ideas from those. And artists have been uh, getting ideas as well. And uh, as well as they can, invasive plant species especially, can uh, reduce those uh, supporting 
um, uh, mechanisms such as nutrient cycling, soil creation, and uh, water cycling. But uh, yeah, that's that's a concept, and that's, this is a topic I'd be happy to talk about for hours, but I don't want to take up everyone's time. But that's the first comment. Yeah. <laughs> My uh, wife, I come. From Chicago, my wife loves to swim in the lake, and zebra mussels clean the lake up. Just, it, it's amazing to see the bottom of the lake. It's not so good for the fish and the, and the plants that live there. You know, it helped her swim, but it's not what the lake should be to support. You know, the the life within it. Sure. And my wife is an invasive species into the lake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say a couple words. Um, I was on the forestry board a few years ago. Great board, by the way. A lot of fun. I see some familiar faces. Um, I think it does get back to humans. You know, if we don't care what happens to the planet, we can do anything. We can nuke the whole place, which may happen. Uh, but we're simplifying the world by these invasive plants. Bush honeysuckle supports almost no caterpillars. I look, I'm a professional entomologist, been studying insects <clears throat> actually for 65 years. I was doing it five years old, and we're simplifying the world down to just a few species of creatures, humans and our cows and our corn and our honeybees and... But uh, all these invasive plants like bush honeysuckle and privet are not supporting other creatures. Now, the birds eat privet, they eat bush honeysuckle berries, and they spread them because they have no choice. We're covering up the continent with invasive plants. And, and so, so, like, just I brought these, I just stopped near my house. Nandina has cyanide in it, it kills cedar waxwings. If you don't care about cedar waxwings, it doesn't matter. If you don't care about uh, birds and uh, the, their ability to support young birds in their nests, then it doesn't matter. So if you say, I don't care about our songbirds, I don't care about our butterflies, I don't care about any of these things, then it doesn't matter what we do. We can cover it all with asphalt, we can nuke the whole planet, but I have to think diversity is good. It's nice to see songbirds, it's nice to hear them. When I walk out on the Buffalo River, I see Alanthus trees creeping in there, Sericea lespediza creeping in there, Johnson grass, and what it's doing is it's taking out the diversity of plants and animals that were here before humans came. And um, so either we're gonna have a beautiful world with lots of diversity, or we're gonna have this simplified ecosystem. And a lot of it's becoming that way. Fayetteville, you look for trilliums, you look for um, Jack in the pulpits along the Frisco Trail, you aren't going to see them because the bush honeysuckle and privet have taken over and killed them. And eventually the trees will go too because they're shading out all the young native trees. So I think it's back to an aesthetic thing, but there's also the practical aspect. You know, we want native bees and pollination, even our, humming, our, our honeybees, which are so entrenched now, they're part, partly native. Honeybees will not do well on privet. They will not do well on bush honeysuckle. And uh, so for practical reasons, we want diversity and we want to preserve the things which were here before humans came. Uh, the cedar waxwings have a right to live. They were here before any human, even the Native Americans. So I'd say we're simplifying the world down to like this crappy thing. <laughs> instead of a beautiful thing. And anybody that goes to a place which is still intact, like the tall grass prairies, Chesney prairies, which Joe Wilbright plays a big role in, they are incredibly beautiful. So for an aesthetic reason, we want to preserve these things. Anyway. Thanks. By the way, this is the, I always promote this book, Doug Talon, he's an entomologist, is an entomologist. <laughs> Terrific book. If you want to know about why to try to preserve diverse native plants, he tells you why. He's done the scientific research to show you why. So it's well worth reading. I, can I ask you one question real quick? Yeah. One thing you said, the reason I sort of went down this path a little bit is I was listening to an uh, NPR on a thing called No Mow May, which is this idea that you don't allow people to not mow in May so that 
And then we're tearing out honeysuckle, and I'm thinking, do the pot are, are is, has the honeysuckle become important to things like bees? And it sounds like that answer is no. I'd say no. Okay. Yeah, I've written articles about it. I observe what bees are. I've cut bees for 25 well, years, so I observe where the bees are foraging. And um, yeah, you'll see a bee on honeysuckle once in a while because they're desperate. Just like if you had no food, you'd jump into a dumpster and get a loaf of bread that was moldy. They have no choice. Because, and the same with the birds. They're foraging on bush honeysuckle, but there's no caterpillars there. Well, it just made me think of this situation where, where I was like, well, are we? I, I was thinking about bees after that and thinking, well, they're also not native, right? I know that they're, at, maybe at this point, they're sort of uh, ingrained into the ecosystem, right? Yeah. After having been here <clears throat> long enough. Um, right. There's thousands of species of not uh, of native bees in the U.S. There's sure. Like 4,000 species of native bees. And the, actually, the, hun the honeybee does affect native bees adversely. Right. That's what my assumption it, would be. It, it does. But it's too late. And it may be too late for, in my opinion, maybe too late for bush honeysuckle and the Atlantis and privet. But you can do what you can. That's what I try to do. I try to do what I can. Uh, it, it, it may be too late to get it all out of there. Sure. And Joe Robright can probably tell you more about prairie systems and the work involved in trying to preserve them. Thanks. But beneath the uh, bush honeysuckle, it's it's basically a desert. There's, there's not even any ground vegetation. Ticks do love it, though. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's bad for erosion. I mean, yeah. it just everything watches. My name is Joe Wilbright. I'm the president and director of Ozark Ecological Restoration, Inc. I founded it. I'm a retired building contractor, and I founded this company in 1998. We, uh, our mission statement is restoring unique Ozark natural communities to pre-European settlement. So we can't restore the United States with a five-man crew. <laughs> <laughs> but we can identify those unique natural communities that still exist primarily in Northwest Arkansas when we started. We now manage all the tall grass prairies, publicly owned in the state of Arkansas, uh, with the exception of the black clam prairies in South Arkansas. So, my good friend Joe Neal identified uh, using GLO maps from 1831 to 1838. We have copies of those. So we know where the prairies were in Northwest Arkansas. Approximately 60,000 acres in Washington County. There is less than 500 acres left in Washington County. Now, Fayetteville is one of the, the only town that I know of, one of the few towns that has identified their prairies and tried to protect them. They've protected Woolsey Wet Prairie started out at 27 acres. It's now about uh, 100 and some acres. And they burn it every year. And usually we have the contract that's put out for bids. Cowley's Prairie is. Uh, Lake Fayetteville, and then so we identify where these by using three methods. One is oral history is the, one of the best people. People usually contact me because they know who we are. Then we take the GLO document and we look at that, and then we go out and driving. I've been driving down the road and I'll see what we call indicator species. We see rattlesnake master and big blue stem and uh, viatris. We'll stop, find out who owns the property. And we've purchased numerous tracts, and then we purchase them through our nonprofit. Then we facilitate and transfer them to the Arkansas Heritage Commission or the Nature Conservancy or to the private entity. So we have very few sites left. So I think our concentration we don't need to go to cornfields, although we do a lot of that. Where we go to an old cornfield, we plow it up, we just get, we go out and collect seeds off of Chesney Prairie, and we try to restore these areas. But what we're trying to do is we end up with 40 up to maybe 100 species. But historically, there were 700 to 1,000 species on these prairies. So what, what do we want to do? Uh, a friend of mine in the Nature Conservancy said, well, we're not interested in postage stamps. Well, you, you buy all these postage stamps. We need entire ecosystems like the tall grass prairie. 
which is the largest tall grass prairie preserve in the United States, if not the world. It's about 50,000 acres over Pawhuska. I go there many times a year and learn from, from the Nature Conservancy's work there. So identify what's in Benton, Washington County, and in this case, Fedville, Arkansas. Preserve those er ideas and uh, those areas and get rid of the non-natives. You can't get rid of all the bush honeysuckle in, in Fedville. On the good side, the bush honeysuckle in Fedville, Arkansas, furnishes our nonprofit with a great source of revenue. That revenue goes to purchase other sites that are high quality and to our scholarship program, which we've assisted in. About 20 students have graduated with masters and PhDs. And um, that's where most of our revenue goes for that in land purchases. So concentrating on Fedville, Arkansas, uh, there's one site that I think that is already probably lost across the street from Cowley's Prairie. I think it's going to become a, a solar array. That has a lot of high quality prairie out there. And around town, I've, I've identified about a dozen sites in Fedville and the surrounding area. They've all disappeared. Beautiful 40 acres is now a subdivision across south from Woolsey River. That was an extremely high quality prairie. Um, so concentrate on the natural communities that you have that you want to preserve. Fedville has, probably of all the cities in Northwest Arkansas, has the best insight to saving these things compared to the other cities, which have virtually none. But uh, so I just, I like the fact that you're having meetings like this. But don't spend all your time trying to eradicate bush honey something in Fedville, Arkansas. The bush honey something capital of the world. And uh, I don't know if really right. Let's just get rid of it at Lake Fedville and the public owned prairies and the public owned lands that the city of Fedville <coughs> owns. You can, you can affect those areas. You cannot go to a private landowner and say, you have to get rid of all of this. We're going to find you. <laughs> That's just not ever going to happen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What, I have a question. Uh, uh, along Clabber Creek, there was that old golf course that they've turned into the yeah. parkway there, and there's a lot of little blue stem and stuff in there. Is that on your radar? Well, you know, I used to run out there back in the 70s when it was a golf course. And it, uh, it's one of those areas that has potential, mm -hmm. but the cost-benefit ratio of restoring that compared to I'd rather see those funds be paid to some company like what we do. And there are, there are several people like us in Northwest Arkansas. Concentrate on those areas that have the potential for restoration. Mm -hmm. That land is so high. You know, we one of the last purchases we made to the Heritage Commission was two acres of next to the <coughs> Sheryl's Prairie in Rogers. Yeah. It was $300,000 for two acres of prairie. I bought 160 acres in the River Valley for much less money than that. Well, I think the city controls that now. So, I, I, you know, that's something that is part of the park district is along the bike path. Under, mm -hmm. under the track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Underwood. So, yeah. you know. But the cost-benefit ratio of buying the land, and, you know, when you get into yeah. urban restoration, but the city of Fedville already owns most of this land that's been protected. Yeah. Now, Wilson Springs was a good example where a developer worked with the city of Fedville and various organizations and uh, set aside of almost a third of that. That was extremely high quality prairie at one time. It was very restorable. But the cost of restoration back to what it historically was is thousands of dollars an acre. Because you don't just do it one time. You have to have continued stewardship. The continued stewardship runs from $100 to $500 an acre per year, depending on the quality and the location and the amount of invasives that attack it. But that cost over years, if if stewardship is, we think, well, we'll just go out there and burn it, and that's it. You have to address those non-native species. I've, I spent all morning carrying a 40-gallon backpack sprayer, Chesney Prairie, and I do that 
every year. I'll do 20 to 40 by those. You know, and at 77 years old, carrying 40 pounds around, <laughs> it gets tired. It's good for you, though. Yeah. It's keeping you young. Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh, look at what you already own. Concentrate on that because that's really all you're going to get accomplished. So you would say that uh, non-chemical methods of management just aren't going to cut it. You, you, can, you can burn it. You can rip it out. But the, the I mean, cost, I mean, I, I understand that hand, you know, physical, physical removal is another level entirely of both work and time and expense if you're going to go that route compared to chemicals. That's true. And, and you run up against two obstacles. There are organizations and public, the public itself is A, opposed, there's a percentage of that's opposed to herbicide applications. There's a big percentage of people that are opposed. To, one of the biggest obstacles we have, we've kind of won the fight over prescribed fire. But when you look at what's going on out west now, they want to take that and compare that. And it's, you know, prescribed fire is the greatest <coughs> restoration you can do. The application of very, I just use this term, very specific herbicides. We have target species like Johnson grass. We have a target herbicide for that. We have a target herbicide for woody plants. We have a target herbicide for forbs, non-native forbs. It is not, you can't just say big X across the word herbicide. It has to be properly applied. And supposedly, if you're a commercial person that's doing it, you have to be licensed by the Arkansas Plant Board. And each applicator has to be go through school. And there's a lot of rules that need to be followed. You have to have insurance. And you have to have PPE when you're, when you're doing this. But without herbicides, we have approximately 20,000 acres in the state of Arkansas. That we on a three-year three burn rotation on prairies and a seven-day-year burn rotation on forest lands. Can you imagine without, those, without the herbicides, it's just not going to happen. It, it, the whole world is going to look like Fayetteville, Arkansas, and it's all going to be bush honeysuckle and Johnson grass. So, given that, protect the areas you already own, save those areas that are high quality. You know, identify them, get an ordinance if that's what it takes. But I've, I've, it's taken almost, they're just now are burning. The last two years they've been burning out. 40 acres next to Woolsey. That goes back to, I think, the first time we burned that was 2008. So it's taken 14 years. And a lot of it went to the solar array. Some had went to the uh, sewer plant. And some went to the, uh, the power plant, the uh, substation. But yet, wisely enough, we still have roughly 80 to 100 acres out of that 160. So I think that was a good compromise. And I think Bedville is the best place in North Star. You see Rogers and Bedville. Bedville's done a lot of really good stuff. Uh, with Kohler Park and around, uh, we're going to be burning at Crystal Bridges this year. So other towns are, I think bedville has been the model over, the, over my lifetime in setting the example for that. So it's the reason I came to the meeting today is just to encourage Fayetteville to continue um, and, and add a little more zealous if that's what it takes. But you know, depending on the politics can change rapidly. <clears throat> when that politics changes, the environment changes drastically. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are running, I think, a little tight on time, but we definitely would want to hear from J yeah. JD and Steve if you, if you guys have. Um, sure, I can just. Uh, my name is JD Wilson. I'm a uh, professor in biology at UA. Um, I work with wildlife and uh, reptiles and amphibians in particular, so critters that most people don't think much about and don't care much about, but I'm used to advocating for them. Um, I also teach intro ecology uh, to undergrads at the university. And, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas that were brought up in the presentation are, th are sort of ethical questions that we often sort of wrestle with in you know, with e ecology students, essentially. And it's totally true that, you know, a lot of these processes are essentially natural processes, right? Invasion, extinction, these are processes that happen naturally on this planet. So when we're talking about these issues, 
it does come back to what we want for humans and for ourselves and our lives in, you know, as we live, right? And so whether we're talking about it from a species-specific perspective or a biodiversity perspective, um, there's lots of reasons why we want to maintain the native species and the native biodiversity that we have here, whether it's um, aesthetic value, which uh, we've talked about, um, or ecological value in terms of the services that biodiversity and certain species provide, like clean air, clean water, healthy soil, um, et cetera, um, or even economic value. You know, uh, we talk a lot about, you know, in, in my sphere, um, you know, why should we care about little frogs and slimy salamanders? Well, now that we have, you know, genetic techniques and biochemistry, we're finding all kinds of cool medical applications for some of these species that nobody cared about before. And some of our new medicines come from these species that nobody, nobody would have ever cared about, except that when you started looking at their skin chemicals, sure enough, they've got things that, uh, you know, are very useful to us as humans. So, you know, I think there's lots of reasons why we should advocate and care for native species and native biodiversity. And just because we've already done lots of damage to native ecosystems and our planet doesn't mean that we should throw up our hands and say we can't do anything. And we now have a huge array of tools to try our best to improve the ecosystems around us um, and manage ecosystems more appropriately. Um, and so, you know, I think even though you could argue that, you know, 100,000, a million years down the road, our native ecosystems would adapt to bush honeysuckle and we'd have new species that, you know, a, a diversification of native or of, you know, now native insects, say, to take advantage of that. You know, this is not in our lifetimes or our children's or children's or children's lifetimes. So if we want to preserve these, these species, I mean, we need to do something. So I would argue that uh, all this effort is not wasted at all. And when I take students out to a place like Wolsey Prairie and show them what a hayfield should look like, what a, what a native prairie should look like, and watch their eyes light up when they see that, you know, each goldenrod head has 30 species of insects running around on the top of it. When you look close, you see whole food webs happening right there on a piece of goldenrod. Um, you, you realize that this is something that's worth putting time and energy and funds into. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Steve Allered from Springdale. I didn't prepare any remarks. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, well, uh, thank you all. Thanks, William, for the, the conversation happened. Huh? Yeah, That's great. and uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I mean, I would love to sit for another couple hours uh, and talk about this myself. And I have, um, you know, I when when William mentioned that he was going to maybe do this, I, I finally ordered this Beyond the War and Invasive Species book by. Uh, permaculturist uh, and have been digging into that a little bit, um, which doesn't really contradict much of any of what y'all said. A lot of what she's discussed so far has been one, methods, you know, chemical use versus, versus others. Um, and then I think the other thing that I, I have been appreciative of in that is looking at invasives not as an isolated thing that humans just brought. You know, it's invasives tend to come in on the cusp or behind with or behind massive land use change habitat destruction significant ecological change um, and patterns primarily human induced so you know again um, i think that you know one of the th nice things about that is looking to what we can do uh, as opportunities is yes be aware of and, and work with or work to manage invasive species but also, you know, potentially keep an eye out on other things like, um, I think, Joe, you were saying, you know, there was that 40 acres over by Woolsey that got developed into a subdivision. You know, how do we preserve that land and conserve it um, instead of trying to pull invasives out of the next best plot that's, you know, a couple miles away? Um, and, um, you know, I, I'd love to, if everybody would be able to, 
or maybe throw out quickly, uh, you know, is there anything that you think that this board or this municipality should try to incorporate or add or change or things to look for um, in their invasive management? You know, should we advocate for fire and grazers as our primary land management techniques in town? I mean, you know, our, you know, that seems like an interesting idea to me, but I don't know if there are things from your specific disciplines or expertise or experience that you might recommend um, it, briefly, because I know we're past time. Sorry, John. Well, we've always known that the, the best goal is to, is to mimic relatively recent historic um, disturbance regimes. So in North America, and especially in our area, it's been very, very frequent prescribed, very, very frequent wildfires and uh, intense periodic uh, grazing by, by megafauna. So previously and historically that was bison, but we don't have that anymore. So cattle can fill that role or you can reintroduce bison. You can reintroduce fire in the form of prescribed burning. Um, I would also advise don't fall into the trap of looking at diversity as it's some kind of identity politic because oftentimes it does become that. Um, diversity, if you read a lot of uh, good studies uh, by a professor of ecology at University of uh, Columbia in New York, uh, Shahid Naim, um, he's really shown that diversity, uh, ecological diversity also gives a, a habitat or an ecosystem much more resistance and resilience to disturbance. And disturbance in the form of introduced invasive species or exotic species. Um, human events, if someone goes through there, walks through there, um, the more diverse uh, 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 a natural area is, the more likely it's going to be able to repel those those negative actions. And also, um, you know, we looked at the, the time scale, the geologic time scale of uh, historic um, um, mass extinction events. I think it's very important to remember those occurred over over millennia. So whenever species uh, face a catastrophic event, they have three options: they can uh, adapt, disperse, or die. As my professor always said, and uh, they have a much more much more ability to do that when they have 10,000, a million years to do that. They can, you can see speciation occur. You can see them come, becoming other species. Or they can disperse into a new area, as we saw with the wild horses, or more, most, or many cases they just die off. When that big catastrophic change happens, that land use change, or an invasive species comes in, they've only got maybe 10 years but to, to make that choice. And many times they, they just unfortunately die out. So I would say those three things. Preserve when you can, um, remove invasive species, adaptive, use adaptive management in your natural areas and your park systems. And uh, you know, like I said, don't fall, don't fall prey to identity politics. Okay, thank you. One closing comment. Um, in order to sell this, it's going to cost money. So you got to go to the city board and get the money to do it. And the big selling points, I think, all these prairies that I manage, these sites in Northwest Arkansas. Dr. Wilson and multiple other professors at the University of Arkansas have graduated numerous kids with PhDs and master's degrees, and their work on their thesis or their dissertation has been on Chesney Prairie, Stump Prairie, Woolsey Prairie, Searles Prairie, Baker Prairie. These are a huge resource for education. That's the economic. You can't put a price on the education of how many kids have gotten degrees utilizing <laughs> these sites. And so you have got to get the city, Fayetteville, to fund the cost of these restoration projects. And it's a, the hard sell is what's it going to cost? And you tell them the initial cost of restoration. Okay, we can do that. But you got to do the funding forever. It doesn't, one burn doesn't solve the problem. So it all, everything boils down to money. But uh, JD can validate the importance of these sites. And we have purchased or been involved in the restoration of every one of these sites the last 23 years. So i become, my wife says I've become too impassioned about my work, but I think, I, I think it's just yeah. I have a question, and I feel like somebody in this room knows, and I'm just being nosy. I've watched it over my Stonebridge <clears throat> golf course. There's a huge prairie, and somebody's been 
managing it. Is that you? It's been really It's owned by watch. Watershed Conservation Resource Center and Sandy Formica and her partner okay. purchased that, raised the money. And, and something else, everything that we're doing, not just prairies, uh, uh, Logan Springs Cave uh, around TNC just bought, we were restoring about uh, 200 and some acres there. Almost every site, it's either Walmart thumbprint, Walton Family Foundation thumbprint, or one of the Waltons personally. We have a huge resource here. That no other place in America has this. I wouldn't be in business if it didn't have all these grants coming from every direction. We're overwhelmed with them. We can't even keep up with all of them. And so uh, it gets down to the money. But uh, Fedville, I'm sure, capitalizes on a lot of those sites. Uh, that resource. So work that resource as much as you can. But the thing that I keep pounding enough talking to you about is you have to have a long range plan. And the best site the Fedville has right now is, is like Fedville, that whole area. I don't know how many acres is out there. I forgot. Total. What's the total of like Fedville uh, public lands? Okay. Uh, a lot off the top of my head now. I want to say it's 420. Now, Cowley's Prairie is not very big, but it used to be bigger than what's there. And it's what I call a medium restoration site. It's had a lot of uh, had a lot of degradation. That site has a lot of potential, and it has a lot of different natural communities. There's, I've identified four or five different natural communities on this site. And so that's... That would be one of my focuses for the city of Fayetteville. And the um, and I, the, the, the piece across the road that's going to be the solar array may or be already a done deal. If it is, it's, but that was a pretty high quality. I found a lot of high quality plants in that prairie. Thank you. Thank you. JD? I guess I could just uh, add sort of from the other side of that argument. Um, I, so I've been in Fayetteville for about 10 years now, I think. And even in that time, it's been amazing to watch the landscape around the city develop. <laughs> and we're, we're probably at a pretty critical juncture where the number of these high quality remnant sites that are left is dwindling fast. Mm -hmm. And some of these sites, especially the, from the perspective of my critters, um, once they're gone, they're gone. You yeah. know, my, my frogs and my salamanders and the same with a lot of the insects and plants, you know, it's it's not like uh, birds that can fly back when you restore a site and get it, get it again. Once the frogs are gone, they're gone. Um, and so, you know, we're probably, it's a good time to start making a play to, to grab what's left and preserve some of these natural communities that are hanging on around the city. And Woolsey went from 75 native plants when we started to over 400 native plants today. And no seed was introduced. It was simply fire and herbicides. Mm -hmm. And uh, the section 404, that was a, a section 404 uh, mitigation site. Because the city destroyed nine acres along the creek, so they had to mitigate 27 acres three times under that old rule. That 27 acres kept getting expanded to 60. And the city... Uh, my original contract on that was $150,000, and I said, let's don't, do not do what the Corps of Engineers wants. Don't go in and spray it and kill everything. Let's try to retrieve that relic seed bank, because they wanted 180 species within five years. Within five years, we had 400, and we didn't do anything except burn and herbicides. Subsequently, the city of Fayetteville, there, they, you, there could be some argument about this, ended up with 90 extra wetland credits worth somewhere around $3 million. So that project netted the city somewhere between two and two and a half million dollars profit just by following the correct restoration. Now, how many sites are in Fedville that we could go do that with? And that's a little known fact about that whole wetland project. Well, Joe, let's make a list and put a number on that and go to council. Actually, actually I wish we could do that in, in, in the woodland area. I wish we could use a, a similar method. There's a lot of potential out there. You know, we've got Mount Sequoia, which Nate and, and his group, with use of volunteers solely, or yeah, 
in Mount Kessler too, I'm starting to see more and more elanthus and, and bush honeysuckle on top of Mount Kessler. We could, we could quadruple the native species on sequoia and Kessler with mm -hmm. one prescribed burn and with oh with that, three with three rotations. I think that's something Dr. the city needs to property. Focus on. That, yeah. that is on my radar. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, one hundred percent is we to took, get a schedule we took of property burns. right here in the city of Fayetteville, a fifteen acres up on. Township, township. We do a lot of burns in the urban areas. Next door, right here in the middle of town. <laughs> you can burn safely in urban areas. Doctor Eisen, no, we I had. Uh, I guess yeah. it. I'm yeah, saying yeah. it's directly. <laughs> it's the <laughs> safest place, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's and, I, and, I, I, right up against them. And we missed burning this year because of the weather conditions. But Doctor Heinz was placed after three burn rotations. Uh, we had 50 native species that were in bloom that would never. We're not there. It was nothing but a layer of. A hundred years of, of uh, detritus, you know, mm -hmm. oak leaves. Yeah, and that, it took three rotations before it manifested itself. Well, Gregory Park, we've been talking for years. I've about, been that. Uh, I've, there. I've been that three times. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Told exactly what they needed. To do, yeah, but it never happened. Still need. So that's where we need the funding. Uh, we actually need. I'm not, I'm not saying we don't need to focus on the prairies, but I, I oh, hate no. seeing our woodland areas oh, degrade to we the extent manage, that they are. We have 2,000 some acres of prairies all over the state. We have over 15,000 acres of woodlands. We yeah. do the same thing. Yeah. But prairies are my passion because they're, they're so much more aesthetically pleasing. You know, cities, burgeoning cities need green space, and what better green space than a nice, healthy forest and prairies with good interpretive trails on them? Exactly. It increases land values, increases the desire, desirability for people to come here. That increases the businesses that want to get established here, improve water quality, get canneries, bot bottling companies, things like that. So, In terms of the connection to the university and to education, I mean, I, I could add it. I've got a record somewhere, but I've probably taken hundreds of, of undergraduates out to Wilson over, over the last you know, seven or eight years. And, you know, the educational, I mean, getting students out there to a beautiful, well-managed site like that is worth a hundred hours in the classroom of droning on and on about, you know, a textbook or whatever. So, Gentlemen, thank, thank you thank so you. much for your input. Thank you very it's been much. a wonderful conversation. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Are we jumping back to number three? Yeah, we're gonna. We've got some other agenda yeah. items. You're welcome to stick around. If, if you, if anybody wants to grab a beer after, I'm available. But I understand <laughs> if uh, if you got. I know it's a lot. Of, I know you got families to get home to. Thanks, Neil. Thank, Thank you. Um, the plaque is getting ordered. I think I'm gonna uh, work and try to get a bigger plaques than we've had before on the for our amazing trees. They end up being these eight and a half by elevens, and they're really tiny. And I'm like walked by the ones down the street and I'm like I think we need to do bigger and better so um, I'm working on that aspect of it Great. Um, and then this is a, a lot of repeat information the last meeting on the state trees and state championships we're still looking for some of these um, that are out in the woods and, and Nate here is probably one of our better resources that could <laughs> identify where some of these might possibly be um, so I would love for us to start searching in some of our parks, as I stated before. And I found the fringe tree um, in Walker that's a nice specimen that that'll win. Um, yeah. Uh, what else do we got? So we have Jim that's going to take over on July. Does anybody want to volunteer to give a presentation up for August? I can't do August. John Crow. Makes sense. I mean, you did one pretty recently, but I'm. I'm oh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I, I probably you? can't do July or August. Uh, you're doing July. Mm -hmm. um, but I could do September on late. I was going to do maybe look into landscape performance metrics. Okay. <laughs> but I was going to look do pollinators, you know, and, and, okay. and uh, in between the trees, you know, you got to plant something that mm. feeds the birds and bees. For sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Corbs and ground cover. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then we have September. Um, uh, all right. I'm just going to move along.
problem. Is that all right? Yep, go for okay. it. Close bids. Uh, building Exteriors has won the bid. Uh, I'm still working on with them to get a, a, a timeline. Um, this project has actually been a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Uh, code changes. Uh, the street tree requirements passed through the Planning Commission and they're going to be at City Council on June 21st. And uh, I don't expect a lot of of kickback on that. I'm hoping it gets put on a consent agenda, but you never know how that works. So we'll see. Melissa is still out for a few more weeks and I'm covering for her. Um, I'm also working on the fall projects and, um, you know, I think next year I'm really going to be working to try to get some of these controlled burns that, that we've been talking about and I'm hoping with our um, urban forestry inventory analysis that information will be in there. And, uh, part of that. Um, that project also uh, will be on the city council for or for approval um, for that contract, uh, and it's with Planet Geo. So that's also on uh, June 21st. So is it just going to be an update of the the count? The what explain mean? what else is going to be a part of that, if, if briefly. The okay. urban forestry analysis is going to be an inventory analysis and then a management plan. So they did the original inventory, right? They did. And I don't believe they have a lot of the same people that did that one that in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe they have a lot of the same people. So I'm expecting something very different than what they've done before. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. do you think that will include, uh, I can't remember the website, but I think in one of the previous presentations you or someone noted about a GIS application to do individual tree monitoring. Yeah, um, they had talked about that. At one and time. I, I, I can't recall. I can, I'm sure we can go back. I, um, it, but uh, I, I don't know about I, tree monitoring, specific tree monitoring. I, there was we're still a entering source thing. Survey one, two, three. No, no it was something like that though. I mean, I slowly I keep adding all the trees that I know we've planted uh, um, into our GIS system with the yeah. dates and the condition of them as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I've seen them in there. I just didn't know. I, I remember there was a specific interface that we looked at that looked interesting. That uh, that seems like some eastern municipality in the Carolinas, maybe or something. Was even I can't recall. Charlotte, maybe I think. Anyway, no. okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Oh, uh, well, I'll just finish up. Celebration trees, is they said, so I think that covers all of that. That's one of the questions. Yeah. Have you, have you chosen the list yet? No, 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 I'm not even close to that. You know, you got to get with, uh, all three, you, you pick out some trees and then you like send it and hopefully they can give you an estimate on those. Most likely they, they so, will give so you, you did, different ones every time. You did time. last year, right? I did. I did. Father Gia? Mm -hmm. I can't remember, probably. I remember that one. Okay, yeah. yeah. It went quick, too, though. That one in the Sweet Spire. Virginia Sweet yeah. Spire. That's another yeah. one that people... I think I want to try to get service berry if I can. That's mm -hmm. one that I was like, oh. Yeah. Since I've been eating well, all of it. be good to go again. Papa's good every time, and I will try to get it every single time because everybody in the city loves yeah. a Papa tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I was going to ask about the, the replanting on the Cato Springs Trail. Did that extend west of Cato Springs? Kind of out toward Kessler and closer to Kessler? Um, yeah, it, it, across that one bridge, when you go into that open field with the, all of the cow repair on the one side and then it kind of opens up mm -hmm. yeah all the way to the end on the right uh, west side of the trail um not quite to the next bridge before you get into uh, mount kessler park proper right right but yes it did um well they didn't they didn't do all of them there's still two or three dead trees there really did they okay i'll have to double check I'll, on that. Uh, I'll take a close count next time because I was assuming that that section wasn't included because I've been on no, it for some it was time. included. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a few that have not been replaced. And in fact, two or three of them do have a red flag on. Oh, okay.
I want to finish up that section of trail, by the way, and go all the way um, to Kessler proper because yeah. there's room for a lot more there sure are. Tree, well, trees there's even, in that field. Yeah, there's, guys, there's always room for more trees. And that, that particular no, stretch no. for sure. Yeah. Any more questions? No, I'm good. I have a question. So I took my youngest on the little Mount Sequoia loop that we did yeah. that one time. We got lost a little bit. But I don't know who who takes care of that. Is it the parks? Mm -hmm. There's a huge fallen tree from one of the storms across one of the main trails. Okay. Like we thought we were going to have to. When like, was this? This was last weekend. Generally, it's I mean, the. Um, huge. The Ozark off-road cyclists okay. volunteer, and they get out there with chainsaws, and they and the, remove all those. Boards. It was a big, and it was a huge ash across, not one of the little offset, but off the main. Okay. Um, you can, park. anytime you see something like that, okay. we have this cool site uh, on our website. Okay. Click it. It's called Click It, and you Click. go in and report stuff like that okay. or anything, you know, like a street problem, flooding problem. And it's pretty cool because then they send us a report and it goes directly ah, to the right people, yeah. and you don't ever have to pick up the phone or anything. Oh, hey. It's kind of nice. And it's anonymous, too. Well, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I should have told this group that. Your email intake just doubled, John. Whoops. Yeah. Click it. Any other comments or public comments? The trail yard, we're talking about going to uh, Mount Kessler, uh, that Cato Springs Trail. There is swamp milkweed occurring mm -hmm. in that trail area there, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to plant swamp milkweed in a little area. I'll talk to you about that. I'm going to adjourn the meeting if anybody wants to make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. Well, thank you all for Aye. sticking around.